Okay, so like to white tap everyone, Shannon Wagner and Squest. Um, good afternoon, I'm Shannon Wagner. I'm the Vice President of Research here at TRU. And I'm really pleased to be here to have this uh, opportunity to welcome everyone and to hear from Dr. John Church, who's going to give us his inaugural professorial lecture in just a few minutes. But before we get started, I think it's really important that we acknowledge that we're gathered here to together today on the traditional and unceded territory of Tekemloops to Shikwetmik, and that our first house, the TRU campus here in, in Kamloops, sits on the, um, the lands of uh, Tekemloops to, to Shikwetmik. And that we're, we're really grateful to be here and be able to do events like this on these lands to be guests. So with that, I want to uh, announce Dr. Church's lecture and say that like previous inaugural lectures at TRU, this event is a celebration of one's academic journey. As we all know, the academic career path is not easy. There are many of us in this room that know that. All who are named full professors have achieved something remarkable. They have a right to be proud and to have an opportunity like this to share their talent and skills with their colleagues, friends, family, and community in this way. Being promoted to full professor involves a rigorous process. An applicant's research, teaching, and service are thoroughly evaluated by peers who assess the quality and impacts of their contributions at local, national, and international levels. To become a full professor requires dedication and passion. It is a remarkable achievement and one extremely worthy of recognition. In getting here, professors have made a significant contribution to knowledge. They have conducted important research and they have disseminated that knowledge to others by teaching and writing papers. In addition, they've demonstrated service to students, colleagues, and most importantly, to community. So with that, today, we are able to celebrate John's academic journey. He was named full professor in 2023, and he's currently the BC Regional Innovation Chair in Cattle Industry Sustainability. John has played a strong leadership role in bringing this funding and creating industrial partnerships during his time at TRU. His inaugural professorial lecture titled Emerging Precision, Ranching Technology is Enabling a Smart Biome. It feels like there should be a semicolon in there that I missed. Uh, looks at innovative practices and technologies leading to the sustainability and enhancement of the livestock industry, rangelands, meat production, and related product, products. Uh, these lectures are an excellent showcase for research at TRU. The world needs to know that our faculty have earned the respect of their peers for the impact of their work. It's why I, events like this one matter. They speak to who we are and what we will become as an institution. I look forward to Professor Church's lecture. And with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Met, Mark Met Petkow, Mark Petkow, who is a professor here at TRU in the Department of Physical Sciences Physics, and he's going to give us an introduction to Dr. John Church. Uh, thank you, Shannon. Uh, I mean, Shannon. Uh, it is a great honor to be here introducing John. I found out all of uh, 10 minutes ago I would be happy this honor. But a month ago, he said, oh, you know, you were going to introduce me, but then, but then uh, Locke said he would do it. I was like, oh, no, John, it's fine, it's fine. And then today, I heard that uh, Tom Piper was going to introduce him. And, and uh, Tom was sick, and then Shannon was going to introduce him. But Shannon didn't know she was supposed to introduce him. So here we are. Um, and I, I have about 20 minutes, I think you said, 20 minutes. <laughs> so I'm not going to take 20 minutes, but uh, one of... Uh, uh, the great things about John, and I think one of the things that's led to this success, is his ability to talk. He will talk to anyone and everyone, and uh, it served him really well. Um, I, I don't even know how we first got started, but I think he just came up and talked to me. He said, oh, you're in physics. Uh, I'm uh, looking at infrared cameras. You know, is that of any interest? And I said, well, I've got some students, and 
they know how to take data, da da da. And so we introduced uh, a physics student, uh, Paige Hegedorin, uh, into the world, the fascinating world of infrared thermography. And we immediately applied it to cows. And so the first thing we had to do was build a fake eye. We did all of this work in the lab, which was great. And Paige did an awesome job. And then it was like, well, we should really do this on real cows. And so John said, well, hey, Paige, why don't you come with me? We are going out to the farmland, and it will be, it will be fine. Well, it turns out that, uh, so she did some infrared pictures of the cows, but it turns out it was also a castration party. <laughs> now, your normal physicist doesn't really do castration parties. Uh, and I think about halfway through, poor Paige had to <laughs> retire into the vehicle and catch her breath. At any rate, uh, another trait of John is his, um, his uh, generosity. He, uh, at some point, we've been doing some infrared thermography, and he said, oh, there's this conference in Florida. You should come. It's at Universal Studios. I said, that's great. That's fantastic. And then a week before, he said, you know, I I've been asked to give this invited talk, but, but I think you should give it. <laughs> it's like, oh, OK. And of course, it's Universal Studios, so I thought we had to make a little movie. And so I did, and it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, so that was, a, a, yeah, the, the good, bad, and the ugly. We, we did the whole thing. Uh, and then every time I turned around, he seemed to be into some new kind of technology. It was then drones, uh, you know, synthetic cows, uh, ear tags. And there was always an angle for physics students. And uh, I've had a lot of uh, uh, students work with John. Uh, Justin Mufford, where's Justin? I saw him here. Anyway, he was uh, another student, undergrad student, who brought mice into the physics lab, which, which cost me some political capital in the physics department, but uh, turned out to be a great experience for Justin, and uh, um, it was a pleasure to be involved with that. So, without further ado, your inaugural professorial uh, talk. I look forward to it. Um, it's always a good time, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. I promise I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain the mice. Mark is still recovering from that, by the way, <laughs> as is the animal care committee at the time. This is a pi picture of my great-grandfather, and it's just proof I show that I'm, I think, probably the fourth or fifth generation of my family to, to uh, raise cattle. This picture was from 1911. What I really think is cool, though, is not my grandfather, but, but my great-aunt Hazel. And my uncle had told me that his mother had told him her Mom could ride, rope, and shoot as good as any man, and, and did. She wasn't a homemaker. She was out working the cows every day. And I just love that we got the evidence to prove it. I don't know if she had a purple blouse. Doug Bouse colorized it. One of my other big passions, of course, is electric vehicles. And this is my, my favorite one. It's actually an electric motorbike. I, I park it. Uh, they have a new, uh, outside of the, the research center, they've got this bike shed and a code, and I can drive it in there and lock it up in there. I'm kind of skirting though, I mean, it's, it's kind of bike, it's kind of motorbike. I say it doesn't leak oil and so I park it in with the bicycles where it's, it's secure. But my most passion, my big passion became in 2014, and if you want to show the first drone parrot, I saw some kids playing with drones in, in Riverside Park. And it amazed me, this is my very first drone I bought back in 2013. I realized, oh my God, they're on their phones controlling this thing, but more than that, they're controlling the video, and they can see what the uh, what, what the drone can see. So, so that, that 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 was fantastic. And then you know, a lot of people ask me, so John, how many drones do you have? That's a question. It's almost as bad as Joanna when they ask me how many bicycles and motorbikes do I have. I don't know. They're all in Joanna's garage, but <laughs> but as far as drones, I I quit counting when I hit 20. Precision agriculture has been around for a while, and, and in the farming world, it mostly means that their rows now are really straight. They're all, you know, they get in, I don't even know what they're doing. They're not driving those tractors anymore. They're kind of just monitoring. I can see Lincoln's nodding his head. They're watching the football game. But as they make the corner, they don't overseed. They shut off nozzles and, and things like that. But it's been slow to move to precision ranching. But I think that's about to change in, in, in a real big hurry. So I'm going to be talking today about drones, uh, smart ear tags, boluses, virtual fencing, remote weighing, and then finally precision breeding. So just six things, six transformative 
technology. Oh, thank you, Kingsley, for coming. So I just do want to shout out to Kingsley and Depeche. I wouldn't have made tenure without these two men, but they don't know what I'm going to be talking about because I kind of moved on from, we did some great groundbreaking chemistry, chemistry work, but uh, we're, I'm only going to be talking about the period from when I made tenure to full, not the stuff that got me to, but I wanted to, to acknowledge these guys because I probably wouldn't have made tenure without their help. So yeah, we're going we're gonna to talk about drones and... Um, this is uh, our student, Stephen Kiga, and I think we should have got a commission from communications and marketing. This billboard was everywhere, right? You can see there's, there's uh, Stephen proudly underneath. Uh, he completed his master's in the ENVS program. He was co-supervised by bo both Locke and I, and uh, now he's in charge of, of the Living Labs project for Ag Canada. And he's a full-time scientist at Ag Canada with only a master's degree from little bitty TRU ENVS program. So I think it's a real shout out. But when I started back in 2014, th these were my first drones, and whether I was going to use them for remote sensing or to go find lost cows, they were about 30,000 a piece. Now everyone's going, oh God, they're flying a drone. They're flying a drone. So what I wanted to point out, this technically isn't a drone. So it is under 250 grams. It's 249 grams. So it's legal. The only thing that applies, I can fly it around people. I could fly it even at the airport, I think. The only thing I can't do is interfere with, under the regulations with the operation of a normal aircraft. Now this drone, this is actually Matt's drone. Compared to the drones I had, I'd be lucky if I could fly seven minutes. You'd get a good, what is it Matt, 35 minutes with this drone? Maybe, maybe even half an hour? Or, or, or 40 minutes? About 40 yeah, minutes. And, and the range. So we can, I mean, I've asked Matt how far, he, he's braver than I am. Uh, they say you can get it out 15 kilometers, maybe 20, and still get a video feed. So you see that video footage on the controller. Well, Matt, I think you've had it out 12, right? You were telling me. So the, actually, what I love about science the best is the serendipity. Okay, so actually I was very excited, you know, uh, I'm on my, I guess, third career or fourth career as a university professor, but before I was, uh, came here, I was a scientist at Alberta Agriculture, and then before that, I managed a large ranch. And my father took it over when I moved on, and he was running this bison ranch. And I had my new drone, it was a DJI, that white phantom, and I slipped behind the herd uh, as they were handling bison. He said, I wanna watch how these guys are doing. Sure, I can film that for you. And I caught something that has bothered me about handling cattle or bison or elk or any other species. You can see they don't want to go because they parked the side by side, the gates open. Now look, two bison will find the hole. And now if Lance, the, the workers, stayed there, it would have been fine. But Lance started applying pressure. So the herd was going. And it drives me crazy. I see, you know, people are handling a herd of, of, of animals like bison or cattle, and they're actually starting to do what you want, but you start applying pressure too soon, and those other guys haven't had a chance, and the next thing you know, how hard do you think it was for Lance to get those animals to, when he went back a second time? Now he's trained them. I actually used that video. I was quite proud of, uh, I, I be, was asked to, by the Canadian Journal of Animals, or Canadian Society of Animal Science to be their representative on the drafting of our national code of practice for bison, and when they found out I was a professor, you can see in the list there was another one from UFC. He's a veterinarian, uh, but they asked me if I would also be on their scientific research priority committee. I said, sure, I didn't know what I was supposed to do, but I can do that. What I'm most proud of is not just the code, and I think I did things in there like, you know, we've pretty much banned, um, banned forbid branding. Uh, Dehorning is almost forbidden except for under some circumstances. I know, now I wasn't on the beef code, but it puts pressure on the beef code as well. How can we get away with not branding bison or castrating bison or dehorning bison, but yet we still do that in <coughs> beef cattle? So I think in, in a roundabout way, it'll have a big impact on the welfare of beef cattle as well. Now the paper I'm most proud of, I know of Tom Piper in the room, I, I tease him because he's so mad luck. I have one paper that I did on rumen microbiome, I know you know about, 
It's got like 1,300 citations. And he's so upset because he said, that puts me always in the top 10 most cited professors at, at TRU. And he says, church, you and that damn paper from, from New Zealand. This paper is the one I'm most proud of. I think I have seven citations since 2019. But it, it, we were the first people to actually take the code and, and I was determined to turn it into a review paper on Bison. Now, why, why am I, I mean, not that many people have cited, there's not that many people that do research on Bison. But my good friend, superhero, mentor, Temple Grandin, for a, from the minute I arrived and I heard about you could, you could nominate them to be a, a professor, uh, I, I pushed for her to get an honorary doctorate. Now, she achieved it. Unfortunately, it was in 2020, so she had to do it online. She's probably the world's highest functioning autistic person, so she's recognized in her expertise. Her movie is still available if you watch HBO or Crate, you can watch it. But the other thing is, a, sh a shout out is she actually also wrote me my letter of reference to come here. So, you know, the, the cattle industry, as soon as they saw it, Temple Grandin's letter, actually, I think Nancy Van Wagener when she was VP, she actually talked about wanting to frame it and putting it on her wall, because she's on Times Top 100 People. But she asked me to write a chapter uh, in her book. Now, where's Courtney? Courtney's in the back. I don't know how you do it, Matt. Like I saw his environmental seminar series. He's written two books, three books, right? Writing book chapters are hard. Writing papers is easy. Book chapters hard. She asked me, will you write a bison chapter? <sighs> So that's what I've been doing, and it's due April 1st. I almost got it done, Daryl, but I've been working hard at it. So Justin Mufford, ah, Justin, you showed up. Thank goodness. It's so important that I, I, I want to shout out to Justin. Next to Depeche, who I think wrote nine papers for me as a postdoc, right, which helped me achieve tenure with this man. So he was with me for a directed studies project. He was with me for an honors project. He went on and did his master's with me. And we got a publication every time. I'm still on them. One day we'll do a PhD. But he says, no, man, I've had it. <laughs> I've spent. But he was the first to really help me work with drones. I love this picture. This was work that we were doing in Lethbridge. And it was amazing. You know, we can get with drones this unique perspective that imagine that they had students out there with. Oh man, how's it going? Yeah, so they had students with camcorders trying to film the behavior and we came to the scientists at Lethbridge at the mothership, AFC in Lethbridge. We can do a much better job of drones. We can be on top of them, and, but you have to habituate them. You have to get them used to it. But once they get used to it, they're not used to getting attacked by aerial predators. You can just about land on them, <laughs> but we can, you know, start looking at tail, like tail flicks. And, so these, these poor guys, they were castrated with or without a drug called meloxicam, and we could use the drones to observe them in the field. Now Justin took, at, with Mark's help, we were measuring the distances between the calves and the cows, and we could do this autonomously with software. I mean, I think the postdoc at, at, at Ag Canada, correct me if I'm wrong, but she wanted you to take images in a ruler and measure it. Mark came and said, no, 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 we could use image J. We can quickly get the distances of all the cows and all the cows. And he turned that into a paper on using unmanned aerial vehicles and photogrammetry to quantify this spatial proximity. And the amazing thing, we, we found things like animals that were castrated with, with meloxicam would move sooner and farther away from their moms than animals that were castrated without pain control. And it's, it you know, basically was a groundbreaking tool. So this was the infrared, infrared camera. I'm actually recreating the shot from, I was a little thinner back then, Mark, with Paige that he was alluding to. And it was a camera that actually uh, Nancy had made sure I, I, when I got hired that I want to make sure I have to use it to basically measure temperature. And I, I actually forgot, Mark. So I promised I would only cover from two, 2014 forward. So this was our, our, our paper with Paige. And we were comparing, it, on, it was 73 Angus steers, basically rectal temperature, 
And thank goodness, Matt, my new student in the back, I finally found a student after all these years, Depeche, that's willing to take rectal temperatures. Because <laughs> we went out to do a study one time, and I gave him the rectal thermometer, and he said, no way, dude. <laughs> I, I can't do it. Okay? But Matt, you don't, you're the very first. You don't seem to mind at all, right? Being on the south end of a northbound cow. And then we take the, the, the eye temperatures, and actually, they were a perfect fit on the R-squared. The populations, of course, are different because one's an external temperature. But imagine, we don't have to now take them into the squeeze and restrain them and, and stick a probe. We can just use that. Now, while we were there, we also went to Bakerview Eco Dairy. And this is that serendipity I was talking about. Oh, let's go take a picture. All these cows had their heads locked in the dairy cows at Bakerview Eco Dairy, and they were eating grain. Uh, their total mixed ration in dairy. And we took a picture with the thermal camera on a bright sunny day. And can you see in, in thermal, the, the, the dark it is cool and the light is hot. You can see the temperature on, over on the left. What's causing this to be so dramatic? That dramatic on the coats? Amazing. Just from light, not, not from the ambient temperature. Well, this was another what Mark was talking about. As soon as I said, I said, hey, Mark, guess what? Right? We're going to get mice. And, you know, the plan originally, Heather, was we're going to move them over to the HT hospital. You probably heard the story, right? Oh, I was there. But that's how it ended up in the physics lab. And we got four white mice and four black mice. Because I had this in my head that climate change could be really bad for cows. I just had this sense that you know, we've been selecting for black Angus like crazy. Like imagine, like when I was a kid and I'd go to the auction market, almost none of the cattle were black. You actually got badly discounted when I was six, seven, eight years old going with my father to do inspections at the auction market. He was a veterinarian, by the way. He wasn't just an auction market fan. He was there for a medical purpose. And today, it's the opposite. Like, back in the day, if you brought a black animal, especially a black baldy or, or, or a black white face, you got badly discounted. Today, you get, you, get a, you, get a, you get a premium, you get a bonus for black. So we were selecting for black animals like crazy. U.S. is even worse. Like, I mean, it's like 80, 90 percent black down there. So what we found with the black mice and the white, white mice, we made this box, and we were shining the light and controlling the temperature in the lab and alienating most of uh, Mark's uh, colleagues in physics department while we were doing it. But we published this, this was Justin's project, project right? And, and they were pet mice, they were your friends, you named them all and they had a really good life under our, under our charge. Well, what we found is that the white mice would travel more than the black mice. And then I said, I bet that translates to cows. So that's how we moved into, in, into cattle. I want you to remember that for when we, we hit the end. Now, that mouse model, we packed it all up when I was done with it. It was pretty clear. I was never going to be allowed to do mice research, at least in the physics lab, at TRU, ever again. <laughs> but my friend, Doug Inglis, who my first master's student, Paul Moot, ended up doing uh, his PhD with Doug. And we had a master's student, Maximo, and I went down there and I had... And they actually ended up using the mouse model. This is our latest paper from the summer. Uh, this past summer, using our tier U mouse model that we developed. And it's quite tragic, actually. Doug and his wife, Jenny, and the dog, they all got attacked in, in Banff, uh, backcountry camping by a grizzly bear. And, oh, it's really morbid. They weren't just killed, but the, the saw was even eating them. And they, so there is stuff worse than getting gored by a bull lot, just so you know. Anyways, moving on. Convincing poor Justin at the back that he should do a master's degree. So we decided to head to Alberta. And you found a feedlot that, I always get it wrong, a Caslo feed yard, right? Casco. Casco feed yard. And how many cows did they have that? Thousands, right? And he, he showed up and, oh, do you want to fly over the drone? With the drone, oh, sure. So here we go, right? Black cows. Red cows, white cows. And the amazing thing is we got some pretty good heat. I think you hit 38 Celsius down there, which we learned that, that cattle are stressed at that temperature. And we discovered that black cattle, of course, they have 
This is BPM, or breaths per minute, so we fly the drone over top of them. And I look at all those dots and I think to myself, wow, poor Justin and two undergraduates, they had to take a two minute sample of breaths, counting them all, and that was a lot of data points there, <laughs> wasn't it? I mean, I'm sure by the time he was done, if he never saw a cattle video, a, a video of cows breathing ever again, you'd be good, right? Am I correct? Guess what I have for you? Cows breathing, Justin. <laughs> so actually, he was doing it in a feedlot, but we found cows when they're in the field could be a little more sensitive, but we have this, I don't have it here, the hexacopter, but we could go super high. And we had, uh, so they wouldn't even notice, like we'd be up 80 meters and we could use super zoom. But you can see, we could see even within populations, we have two cows, the one on the left is panting heavier than the, than the one on the, or guess, guess the one on the right than, than the one on the left. Well, moving on, we have some new drones and we're, we're gonna show you. Uh, this is the Mavic 3 Enterprise. Uh, it's, it's, it's a fabulous tool. Um, the one on the bottom is the M300. I'm coming into my, five, my fifth season. I call it the GOAT. It's like the greatest drone of all time. Uh, it's, done, it's been our workhorse. Um, the big thing is the super zoom. We're gonna give you a demonstration of super zoom live in a minute. But I'm gonna show you working with Lakeland College and bison. Bison are a lot like Angus cows. They're really hard to tell apart. They all look the same. And we don't brand them. Remember I bragged that I worked hard to work with the code of practice that we're not gonna brand bison because you know it hurts branding. There's no doubt about it. There's no getting around it. Well, how are we gonna tell them apart? Well, this is an ear tag and the number's worn off, but they all have to have ear tags in Canada. And then we can super zoom in and I can read 124-000-300-755858 with that drone, no problem. The remarkable thing is I was probably 100 meters in the air when we did that. Now another scientist at Lakeland College, we were there measuring ear tags and he was doing a fly study and he was using an insecticide and he needed to see how could these, could you use the drone to count? I said, I don't know, I've never tried, but that's that drone there, you can see it way up there. You see the flies? You can count the flies on the back. I, I was actually worried, I think I could count them on the brown one, but the black one, Flies on the black one, that's going to be hard. We were at 100 meters. That's about as high as they legally allow you to fly. And we could count the flies on the back of the cow and enumerate that. So this is our DJI Mavic 3 Thermal. And it, uh, to me, it, it, it's a fabulous drone for two reasons. One, it's got an incredible zoom lens. So how are you making out on the Mavic 3? Let's, let's go with the Mavic 3. So we use this model, where's Matt? Matt, the one thing I did is before she left, I convinced our friend Bovis Kenossin, I don't know how I did it, but I got her to buy it for me. It was six grand, <laughs> and I promised her, unfortunately she moved on by the time I bought it, uh, got it, but I promised her I, if I could get this model, I would, I would turn it into a paper, which I did. But we use it for, for super zoom. Now, you can see this ear tag, it's remarkable, that exact drone, we, can, we compared it to a pair of, of, of just regular binoculars, 49W, using this drone, and you can see B is the binoculars at 60 meters, this is taken just with my cell phone at like 10 meters, right? This, this one here is, is taken, that, that's that drone at 60 meters. These are the two previous models. They were digital zoom only. Now, where did, where did Katie go? Katie, are you in the audience? She is, okay. So I have an iPhone 10. You don't want to go to Brazil with an iPhone 10 because they don't distinguish models. They'll shoot you the same for an iPhone 10 in Brazil as they will an iPhone, but you've got an iPhone 15. They look kind of the same, right? But the zoom on this is incredible. So what we, we published the paper on is there's digital zoom, there's optical zoom, that's kind of the gold standard. That's when you're moving lenses. Then there's digital zoom, which is really, you're just like cropping, you're, you're bringing up the photo. And then finally there's hybrid zoom. 
And I was explaining to Dickie that they basically have just two different cameras and they take two different pictures at the same time and then they use computational photography to, and AI to blend in all the rest. So even though there's no lenses moving, there's only two cameras. You can get incredibly powerful zoom now on your iPhone, right? Like you just got it and it's shocking how much you can zoom it up. So that's, besides chat GPT and all the wonderful thing it's doing, it can bring us this. So this is my latest paper I wrote with my intern from France this summer, Matisse Chagot. And it was published in, the world is changing. When, when Justin was publishing, it was the Journal of Unmanned Aerial Systems. And, right? And they, they decided that, that, and I think rightfully so, that that's probably a sexist name. So they changed the name. This is a Canadian journal, the NRC Canada, Drone Systems and Applications. So getting back to using the thermal. So we discovered that we could take a picture and you put a circle around the eye. And with our floor camera and under lab, and that was the whole point of the work with Mark, we could get a temperature. Well, that same drone, here's, here's uh, Matt from this summer. And can you see the drone? So can we switch it over to live so that you can show the audience what that looks like? So this one is over 250, so we're not going to fly it. But it's got incredible zoom, but it's also got thermal. Now I suspect, so we'll switch back. You can show what you all look like in, in, in thermal, right? But and remember, you're not really measuring temperature. It's, it's measuring the, the radiation going into the microbolometer. So if we could switch back to the PowerPoint, please. So w here we were at the ranch, taking pictures of cows, putting circles around their eye, looking at the average temperature, the max temperature, and I got a sick feeling in my stomach. I don't think that the, the FLIR drones, and Mark and I had a lot of experience with getting it calibrated and sending it back to the company and they use a black box. I don't think the company DJI is doing any of that. So we're now, uh, I've got um, Matt, Matt and Sophie and they're all flying, uh, flying, flying uh, um, the drones to, to measure the temperature to see if, if it's equivalent. <laughs> this, is, this is the electrical tape. Oh, did we shut it off? Oh, do you want to look at the eye? Yeah. So this is the, the original surrogate. I don't know if it exists, but this was the diagram we put in our paper mark with the styrofoam and a copper rod and a water bath. And so I said, well, we've got to be able to do better than, than that. It was, a, it was just another one, like, just show up and, hey, Mark, guess what? Can you make me this? And what do you say, Mark? It is amazing. Every time I come, I brought him a lot of crazy stuff over the years. <laughs> It's always the same. He says, sure, <laughs> every time. So just not unlike our cow head, we made an artificial cow eye. And it's, it works perfectly. It, uh, Mark and Joe Street put this together. And we can, in 30, 35, and 40, we can simulate whether you have a temperature, but it's remarkably stable within, within a quarter Celsius. Well, I have all these different drones and all these different um, uh, thermal cameras, I want to test all of them to see how accurate and under what conditions are we, and it's a lot easier doing it with a model in the lab first before you go out into the field. Now the same drone, oh, okay, you want to switch over? Yeah, so you can see that, that, you know, with the cattle eye, can you put a circle around it? So that's the same drone in the back. It's not transmitting. Oh, it's not transmitting. It's only showing on the screen. But this is incredible tools, right? And we'll show you how we using it at the end. Maybe we'll get the, the M3, show the M3 next. But we also, a huge point, and I've been collaborating with Locke over the years, we share the same interest in remote sensing. And this, uh, one of the vegetation index, you know, Locke and his student Heather, they published a paper demonstrating that this normalized difference vegetation that we see which is basically, we look at the near infrared and we compare that to the red bands. It's actually a pretty good proxy for the storage of carbon underneath the plants. So without having to take the carbon samples, we can infer that from the plants above ground. It was really remarkable work. While we moved beyond that with this multi-spectral drone this summer, 
using remote sensing, on the left is what you normally see with a normal camera, red, green, blue, and then this is a multispectral image of the same field. But the holy grail, and this is something that not just myself, but others like David Hill and stuff have been working on, is plant identification. And what, what we wanted to do was, could we identify thistle, dandelion, and volunteer canola? And why did we pick those three? Well, because the, the drone guy I collaborate with, uh, he supplies me my drones. Um, he just happens to live in Camrose, and those are the three big weeds that they got going in Camrose. So we used a soil-adjusted uh, vegetation index, which is the same as NDVI, but they add the soil component. And then we got a student from the University of Saskatchewan we hired, and he's an expert in AI and this deep learning or machine learning, and you know, I have no idea what's going on. It's like a black box. I don't even think he understands what's going on, to be quite frank. But, lo and behold, it was perfect for detecting thistle. And we could GPS tag the whole field for the individual weeds. And now we can go out and, you know, we ground truth that I never thought we would spray weeds with a drone. This is a DJI Agris T40. We also have a T50, which I'm not supposed to tell anybody about. But China let us have the first one in North America. Carries 50 kilograms of, of liquid fertilizer or, 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 and you can fly to these sites and spray them which we managed to do, and it was just genius. Right? Just imagine, we're not broadcast herbicide over the whole field. We're only spraying where the weed is, and I think we're gonna be getting, with these drones, the same precision fertilizer. Marcus Weber's nephew was there, summer job, U of A grad student, and the traditional way of spraying weeds is some outfit like this, or even a backpack sprayer. So we had a race. Who do you think won? Now this guy could drive a quad really fast. Who, who, head to head, divided the field in half. He had the GPS coordinates, we had our drone. Easily, and he's going like a bat out of hell, like, I, I mean, more than I would be capable of. And the drone did it in half the time. And now, there are all kinds of people that are, like, they're putting on, uh, I think it's coming. In Canada, we can't use drones for spraying legally outside of research. Herbicides or pesticides, you can use it to, to for grass seed or fertilizing. US, you can use a drone anywhere you use a crop duster. So that's a bit of a pain. Now my other passion in working with, with great students like Keenan Baker, we're, we're using LIDAR and multispectral to actually measure forage biomass. So imagine I would go out with ranchers to Douglas Lake Ranch and their cow boss stand would get off his horse and he was like the cow ninja, right? Like Obi-Wan Kenobi and he just kind of overview the grass. I think he's doing a great job and he had all these rules. Uh, take half, leave half. I just wanted to figure out how can we quantify that? Well this is using a LiDAR camera and usually LiDAR looks like this but this DJI camera, did we bring the DJ, did we bring the LiDAR camera? Matt? I think we forgot it. We didn't bring the LiDAR. We didn't bring it. But anyways it snaps a photo and then it uses it to colorize the LiDAR so you get these incredible 3D models this is actually an ortho mosaic. We went to the U of A and we cut uh, one meter squares. I don't know how Locke and his guys do it because we did, what did we do, 30? 30 and I think I, Cameron did, he's now basically Locke Frazier at the U of A. He was your right hand man, PhD student, very successful, moved on. Cameron did 15 I think, Matt did and Mark, Matisse both did what, eight? And I think John managed four clips. So I'm not the guy you want to send out into the field, Keenan. I'm pretty slow. And then you can see it in, in infrared. We think if we merge the two together, we can actually measure forage biomass. LIDAR and multispectral together is, is the way to, to, to get that metric. So I brought my ear tag. So I bought these. This is why you want researchers to do it first and not industry. I'm going to pass it around. It's from Australia, solar powered GPS ear tag. We put that in the cow's ear and it transmits a signal every 15 minutes. I hate to say it, but they were kind of a disaster. They didn't work. For one, the pins started breaking. We were comparing it to another piece of crap technology from Australia. We even tried to trick it because they're using it for, for uh, 
um, cattle identification, like for traceability. So they did. They wanted it one-time use. So I got the smart idea. Well, let's put it on a collar. But we, we lost probably 60, 70 percent of the tags. And then when winter came, the tags all shut off. Then the worst part is we were only getting maybe one or two locations a day. Well, how useful is that? That's not very useful. Like to be useful, I would need at least once an hour to have a clue. And they said, oh, it was operator error. I don't think so. They, they did send us uh, some ones they modified with the regular Allflex ear tag that you can reuse, but I really think it's hard to do these collars. So I think that technology was a bust. But I'll show you some precision ranching technology that was great, friends. The first is these boluses. These are moonsis boluses. I'll pass it around. It goes down the cattle's throat. And from that, we can. it'll last eight years. It'll give a, a, give a temperature reading every 15 minutes. But they also have three axis accelerometers. Now, this is how you put them in. It's not easy. And actually, honestly, I try to, you know, if it's dangerous, I don't like students necessarily putting themselves in harm's way. So something like this, you're laughing, but it's true. I worry. What if they get hurt, right? So I, I, I'm the installer on the boluses. Now, this isn't so bad. What do we notice about this animal? It's a Canadian speckled park. No horns. He can't really hurt me when he's in a squeeze and he doesn't have horns. Unfortunately, that's not always the case, but we had a solar powered wagon. You have to keep the wagon within about 800 meters of the animals, but it sits in the second chamber, the, the reticulum, and it gives us a temperature. And this is, this is from the data. This is what it looks like. And we can figure out when we want to inseminate the cows, which is important if you're trying to create your own cattle breed like I, I am, or if there's a calving event. And then I partnered with a company called Lamazoo. And I did the drone mapping, and they used fused drones and satellites. And we did the Buck Lake Ranch before they sold it, 77,000 hectares. We digital twinned it. So it's an exact digital copy. And you can do this fly through. And then if we could get reliable tracking technology, we could actually see where the cattle go on the landscape. You can see they've made these cow models. So we actually, with my colleagues at Lakeland College, we totally did, did we, we digitally twin the first ranch with this project called Clarity. And with that, we can uh, start to amalgamate all of this data. We call it spatial business intelligence. We can do polygon mapping. We're hoping to add in the ability to me measure the forage, really manage the cows and the landscape that they go on. And then I discovered the transformative technology that I think is going to shake up cattle ranching over the next 30 years. I actually went over to Norway giving a, a drone talk. We went to Bergen, Norway, Joanna and I, and I was all pumped up to give my talk. And the people before me were from the Life Sciences University of Norway. They'd been working on wireless fencing for the last 30 years. Now imagine, look, I know the BC cattlemen tried to make their own collar with some former students of ours. The Life Sciences University of Norway was at it for 30 years, and we thought we could do it in, you know, we had some goofers in mom and dad's basement in their underwear, <laughs> tech company in Calgary making us some hardware. We're going to do this in about eight months? No, I don't think so. But I was able to secure collars, and we started doing this project with no fence. Now, I, I chose uh, to collaborate with Ed Bork at the University of Alberta, and you've seen Poor Matt, who I've been abusing all talk, running around. He's actually, uh, we have a student already, she was just working on containment. But the idea is that you put the collar on the neck and the cows get a tone. And as they go closer to the fence, they eventually get a shock. And here is Alex putting, uh, we were helping her putting the collars on the cows. So this is, is Matt's, uh, uh, Francis's thesis project. And he's, working on his thesis proposal, right? As we speak, he keeps promising me, I'm gonna have it to you soon, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, but this is what Alex did, and I think it's just fantastic. So what she did is she started with some cows and she put the wireless fence at the U of A. Now I wanna add that this is a map I created with the drones uh, to, to show this. And the red fences are the traditional perimeter fences. And then as the cows move, you can close the fence behind them. And they've had staffing shortages, and we get there, and Matt and I show up at the rack. 
God, we can't hardly find anybody. They're really ultra low staffed. And she was mad that the, the ranch workers weren't showing up to move the cows. And she was stressed that they didn't have water. So she asked us just to open the gates. And we did. And they went through the gates. And then she could close the fence behind them. And then go through the gates again. And Alex could, again, just align on her computer. And... Two years now, we had them first as heifers and then cows with calves, 100% effective. Really good, you don't have to worry about your water in the fields anymore. Like if you've got water over here, you can then change it, change the configuration instantly. The remarkable thing, how far is Kinsella from Edmonton? Two hours by car? Long, right? She was doing all this from Edmonton. Just telling her on the cell phone, right? That they're ready, okay, yeah. And we kind of went to check. Yeah, no, no, they're all through. Yeah. So imagine we can do this. The remarkable thing, remember I told you the collars, the, the, the ear tag, the solar panel, when you get low daylight, they, 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 as soon as it gets cold, all this Australian technology quits. Well, they don't worry about snow. The other problem, I think, is they're on the southern, they're using satellites, low Earth orbit satellites from the southern hemisphere, where we're in, we're in the north. But here you can see it was getting down to minus 18. They said even down to minus 35. But that big battery, the solar pa in the collar plus the solar panels keep that battery charged. Well, because of our fires, one of the things I I've seen, Thomas, what was it going to cost to replace the fencing that at, at your family's place that burned up? It was over five million. Five million to replace all those fences. Well, you know, if you just compare it to an ear tag, these collars are. I mean, the satellite collars that you see bears and stuff on, those are a couple, two, three thousand dollars. These are 300 bucks. But if you start offsetting how much it actually costs in savings to build a fence, then this is remarkable. I think uh, Thomas and I, he's worked really hard. We've got a my tax together. They asked us to make some changes, but they already sent the ranch an invoice for their half of the money. So I think when they send them an invoice, it's in the bag, I think, right? Now, we don't want to take it for granted, though, because I know... Like, I know the NDP in Alberta was able to snatch uh, defeat from the jaws of victory. So we want to make sure we get our comments back that my tax want, want. But remote weighing, this is OptiWay. This is a system I brought in from Australia. It's solar powered. Uh, that's about the only, uh, I don't want to slag Australia totally because I think this is a fantastic unit. And we just put their front legs on. They don't even have to go all the way in. We're also using drones to, to weigh animals in the field. And it's remarkable the R squared we're getting with the OptiWay and the drones to conventional scale is, is, is. So in summary, I think we can use drones to, to do, you know, to fly virtual fencing collars, boluses, and scales. These are all components of what I'm calling precision ranching. And we can use these low earth orbit satellites that, that uh, um, Jeff Bezos and, and uh, the man from Tesla there, they're all, what's his, Elon Musk, they're all fighting each other. How fast can they get these low Earth orbits? But that everything will be, like, just like we have smart phones and smart fridges, some of us even have smart glasses. I just took your picture. Stealth. Boy, that's going to be a hard thing for cheating, right? Because I also get, I could actually have somebody phone me and we wouldn't even know. So we're going to have to think about that. I waited 30 years, not 30 years, but let's say since I got here in, well, at least 2014, so let's say 10 years, I saw the drones in the park, that parrot drone. This is what Matt and I did this past summer. We used this base station and we connected it. If you want to show them the thermal drone with the... So this increases the accuracy. The animals have the collars. It's giving us their GPS location every 15 minutes on our laptop, we can see where they are. So we would type into the controller, the lat and the long, and say go, and boom, the drone would fly right there. And it didn't matter if it was 800 meters away or eight kilometers away. It went there every time. And, and then what was really remarkable, at U of A, like everybody else, they're on Black Angus. God, like we were 80 meters up, but the drone would like start at the shoulders and move its way to the collar, and I realized, Oh my God, we can not just only find the lost cows, but we can, we can do individual ID. We know exactly which animal we got. Now, 
when we got the locations on 25 collars, 25 times we were able to go out and fly and, and find the animal we were looking for. So imagine you got a herd like this. Well, now we can tell you not just the herd, but exactly which animals they are. They can be hard to see, but we can now switch to thermal with our drone. If they're hiding, but we know where they're going or where they should be, we can use thermal to see them in the canopy. There you go. In amongst the trees, we can use the super zoom on the drone to confirm that that's a cow in there. Now go and try and just use a drone and find the cows in the trees. If you don't know where to look, good luck. But if you already got the GPS coordinate, it's remarkable. It's easy to find them. Now this is, I have a personal reason why I really need to have this work. This was taken, look at the date. This is the 27th, Mr. Cougar. And a few nights later, Mr. Wolf, that's where my cows are, out on that range. No joke, right? She's sending, oh my God, John. So, you know, you need to get, well, imagine the solution is, this is actually the drone, it was just released today. This is the Matrice 3T drone, thermal zoom, but like on that one. So 200 times zoom, we can actually have a docking station. And with the new Gallagher collars that Thomas is gonna have, they're also gonna have base stations that are powered. I think we can power the dock off of the, off of the tower that we're using to read the collars. We can have a drone inside, and then if the, they all have these three axis accelerometers inside the collar, inside the bolus, if it starts shaking like crazy, we can actually have the drone autonomously take off and fly to that location and then start dropping down. And I think that's all we're going to need to be able to disrupt an attack. It's a real serious problem. In, a, in addition to the fires and the droughts and the heat domes that our ranchers are faced with, the other thing that they're faced with is predation. In fact, the president of the BC Cattlemen's, Brian Kersey, he, had, he lost 50 calves over the course of two years. If you lose 50 calves to wolves, you're out of business. There are leases and licenses in this province that are no, no longer have cows on it. It's unprecedented, right? If you put your cow, you're nodding, you know about this. You're done, right? You'll lose all your calves, so you can't put them out there. Well, I think this is a solution. The final one, how much time do I have? Time. Precision breeding? A little bit? Okay. So I was asked in 2018 uh, by the Senate and uh, to talk about, come talk to them about how bad things could get at a meeting in Vancouver. I was really shocked that they phoned me. There's lots of other people, other more famous beef scientists. I said, you sure you guys want me? And he said, yeah, you, your, your reputation speaks for itself. We've done our homework. We're certain if you come, you'll tell us the truth. We don't, want it, we don't want a commercial, right, about how much carbon, you know, we, we produce less carbon than we did back in the, we know all that. No, no, no. How, just tell us, is, is it a threat? Could it be bad? Now, I conferred with Log and Tom, and I was nervous because I said, you know, we're looking at 2.6 to 5 Celsius in the interior BC, probably all of BC by 2030. And I actually remember one of the senators actually really challenged me on that. You said, You're, we're going to gain five Celsius here in the summer. I said, peak, we're going to get heat waves. They're going to last longer. We're going to have droughts. This is back in 2018, and we're going to have mortalities. Well, I thought 2030. No, no, this, this is 2021. This is the heat dome that hit us. Was that once in a millennium? No. These heat domes come in, and they create all this enormous pressure. We've got another heat dome in Kansas in 2022, landed on a feedlot, just like the one that hit in BC. 10,000 dead in one night. Now, easy math, 2,000 times 10,000. I'm not the finance guy, Matt, but is that 20 million? That's a lot of money. Imagine if that hit feedlot alley in Alberta. It could. I've asked the question, could a heat dome that hit BC hit feedlot alley? The problem is, is those heat domes, like we always believed you needed high humidity. I was in Moringa, Brazil, they have minus, when they, uh, we have minus, uh, you know when it says minus 47, that should have been plus 60. I was in Moringa and they were saying it's plus 60. What do you mean it's plus 60? It's only plus 38, right? I look on my, on my smartwatch. It says, no, no, it's plus 60, but with the humidity. In Brazil, it's like what we do in the, win, like in the winter time. We say, oh, it's minus 52 with the wind chill. It's minus 37 outside. They were breaking records. I turn on the TV. There's a cattle auction going every night on four different channels. I could buy this 
bull on WhatsApp. This is right in the Radisson Hotel. And I was so disappointed or disheartened to see they also got Black Angus. And I talked to the producers. I, I went to a restaurant. This, I was told that the, the beef from these Boss Indicus cows, you can't eat it. Well, I actually saw right on it. They were advertising it was Angus. But I talked to a producer, and they said, they're not. The, the, the Angus are really struggling down here. Yeah, there's a reason. It's hot. But we created these Senapal calves, and they're now at Hefley Creek. So they the discovered a, nat, a breed in, in the Caribbean, and I'm collaborating with uh, Dr. Jo Joanna Urban to show it's not just their coat, but also internally. They've got changes, the heat shock proteins. But the challenge is we learned really fast. They, they don't seem to grow much of a winter hair coat. Now, there's two other breeds. There's a Galloway and a Scottish Highland. For obvious reasons uh, that will become apparent, Locke will tell you why I'm not using Scottish Highland. Have you seen those? They look like Chewbacca from Star Wars, but <laughs> with the big horns. The Galloways are naturally polled. It's amazing to say that they're the same animal. But we can combine them. And this is actually the world's first. This is what I'm tentatively calling the climate master. It's got the slick gene for heat tolerance and the cold gene so it can handle our minus 40. And that's the problem, right? It's not just that we're getting heat domes, but we're getting minus 40 at the same time still because climate change is causing the jet stream to oscillate and it's pulling that cold air from Siberia over. So here's Matt uh, measuring the, the, the respiration rate on one of our climate master cattle in Kelowna from this summer. And Remarkable breakthrough. Our, our master student, RJ, he presented this data. So I'll just show real quick. This is on July 16th and 7th, uh, this summer and 15th, we had a heat dome in Kelowna. So you can see this is at 7 a.m. and this is at 7 p.m. This is just the temperature humidity index. Anything over 72, it's too hot for cows, right? Justin, you got that right? Yeah. You can see though, we had black Angus controls, and then we had climate master cattle that were combined, but some had the slick gene. Half of them had the slick and half no slick. Well, the no slick ones, they were, their breaths were significantly less in heat dome. Now, how did I get that? Well, we used a heterozygous bull. And then, remember that bolus? I don't know where the bolus got to. Who's got it? So it's got this three axis of solar arm. It just measures the activity. The X, Y, Z. Look at the slick animals in August. These ones aren't doing anything. They're, not, they're probably not eating. They're not gaining weight. They're not breeding. These guys are off the scale. That means that they're out doing what they're supposed to be, grazing. They're not hanging out in the, in the trees. They're not laying down in the heat of the day. So I, I think we've got the solution that we can create an animal that can handle 50. Now this is a final one. So this is what I did. Took a purebred animal, we took an adapted animal, the Senapol. We crossed them, we created foundation stock, what I call crossbred Senapol Angus. Now if you want to breed so that it's Angus with the slick mutation, it's going to take you decades of selection to get a 99.9% .9 purebred Angus, but they still have that slick gene. So my Senapol Angus crosses are not Angus with a slick gene. Now, I could do GMO with bacteria and add those genes in, but with the, ma with, with the magic of gene editing, we can actually use CRISPR, and we can just cut away that part of the genome. So I actually met with a company, Acelogen, that's already did it. They've got some in the United States and in Brazil. And I've hired a postdoc, Nell for uh, Pageman. She's working on consumer acceptance surveys at the U of A, trying to see you know, what is, what, what's the people's take of gene editing. You're looking at two full Angus sisters. One's gene edited for slick and one's conventional. And I think this is the future. We could probably move forward with it. Canada, the big advantage we have compared to our American friends we have the best red Angus in the world. And Justin showed in his master's work, black is by far the worst. White is okay, but they usually come with pink skin if they're white, which makes them more susceptible to cancer. But red, he learned from his master's, is optimal. What we need to do is create slick Angus using Canadian red Angus genes using CRISPR. This is the final one. So 
Katie was really nice. She said, oh, I looked at your CV. Oh, man, $5 million. That's a lot of money, right? So this is nothing. Well, no, $5 million is a pretty good pull for, right? This is George Church from Harvard. And his company is Colossus. One project, $328 million, right? I think all in his whole portfolio is over a billion dollars, one professor. That's why he's at Harvard and we're at TRU. <laughs> but what they're trying to do is they're, they're, de they're doing the extinction. They're bringing back the holy mammoth and go to billionaires and people are just throwing money at them. So it's not like Jurassic Park where they're going to try and just clone the woolly mammoth. What they're doing is they're taking its closest relative, the Asian elephant, and they're gene editing it to make the elephant hairy. And then the idea is we'll get enough of them, and then we're going to release them into the permafrost in Siberia, and they're the way to their feet. We'll keep the imagine. Like they got some things to work out. I don't think they've ever done embryo <laughs> transfer in elephants before. Not to mention, I don't know if anybody's told, told cousin George. I think there's a war on. I'm not sure Putin's going to allow you to show up in a big transport plane full of woolly mammoths, but we'll see. I hope that's not the, the, the final solution for, for uh, climate change, or I think we've all had it. I guess the final thing is I'm very excited about this future, this future of ag tech. Uh, through the research office, right, you let me know about uh, Lincoln and uh, that, that Simon Fraser was looking for somebody to tier you to be their ambassador on ag technology for their BC Center for Ag Tech Innovation. So for, I signed on, so for the next year, have we got the contract signed? Not yet. Where's Lincoln? He's gone, see? Went out the back. <laughs> so we, we need to sign the contract by the 15th and then for the next year, I'm gonna still be here, but I'm gonna be working on the livestock portion for the Simon, that's good though, I can also put Simon Fraser on my CV, I guess. But it's been a remarkable journey. Thank you so much for everybody in the room. Thank you for your patience. Uh, you for so Bob was actually, I thought he was supposed to introduce me, but you got to do the summary, so I see he's been taking notes. <laughs> Encapsulate what you heard, Bob. And I haven't been at TRU very long, John, but I've been doing these lectures since I got here, and I have to say, I think you won the award for the most um, entertaining, unpredictable thing that we learned the most about. I, I'm most not stuff. sure, but well done. I said we're going to have the best talk, but we're going to have the best tech. That's right. So thank you very much. So with that, I'm going to invite Dr. Locke Fraser up to do the um, summary comment. And so, Locke. Wow, you know, it's always hard to follow John, and uh, especially since I'm recently recovered from my first bout of COVID. Uh, so, you know, if I start wheezing, you know, uh, but I'm not contagious. And I was looking really closely at, you know, the, the thermal camera that you put out there. And I, I, did you see a lighthouse? Did that, I did not come out in full red, so I think I'm okay. But <laughs> I, do, uh, I do want to talk about my friend, John, John Church, Dr. John Church, Professor John Church. Uh, I've been given this privilege uh, through my response to his uh, presentation to reflect on John's research contributions and accomplishments. First, uh, agriculture. Um, this is John's discipline, and it's such an important field of study. It provides food, fiber, and other resources essential for human survival. It also supports economies, creates jobs, and sustains rural communities. In addition, agriculture plays a, a key role in environmental conservation and shaping the future of sustainable food production. Uh, this last part, uh, I, I'd like to delve into a little more uh, because it's critical as we've learned uh, through John's research and his role in the agricultural industry. Uh, we've learned a lot today um, about precision ranching, and the use of technology in modern agriculture, and we've seen how John's work can offer a path to efficiency, sustainability, and productivity. 
Uh, by integrating advanced tools and systems, John's demonstrating to farmers that they can optimize their operations and make informed decisions to improve animal welfare, uh, reduce environmental impact, uh, and increase profitability. Precision ranching enables producers to monitor individual animal health and behavior in real time using sensors, uh, GPS tracking as we've seen, and of course John's drones. John has a fleet of drones. He doesn't know how many <laughs> of every variety. And uh, the most up-to-date sensors too, uh, to test precision ranching. This data helps identify uh, sick animals early, uh, prevent de disease outbreaks, and improve overall herd management. Precision ranching also has a wider environmental scope. The use of sensors and drones can be used to monitor soil health, pasture conditions, and invasive plants uh, on rangelands. By providing accurate data, technology helps producers make informed decisions to minimize environmental impact and present uh, uh, preserve natural resources. Precision, precision ranching and the use of genetic technologies and DNA testing allow ranchers to select and breed animals as John is doing uh, with desirable traits. And these include disease resistance and high productivity and reduced heat stress, which is what John's mostly focused on. Uh, this leads to improved livestock genetics and enhanced breeding programs. So with the help of remote monitoring systems, ranchers can keep track of their livestock, equipment, and facilities from anywhere. Uh, this real-time connectivity enables quick responses to emergencies and enhances overall operational efficiencies. And finally, technology and precision ranching promote sustainable farming practices by reducing uh, resource wastage, minimizing greenhouse gas emissions, and promoting biodiversity conservation. This contributes to the long-term benefits of the planet and ensures food security for future generations. We're not a, a big research university, uh, like your example in Harvard. Harvard. <laughs> we, we don't get the same sort of government support that the bigger universities receive. And yet, here we have a researcher at, the, at our university at the cutting edge of the field of science. John has managed to secure millions of, of external dollars to advance his field, and what he's doing is very topical right now. And I wouldn't say that John is riding that wave. Uh, he's, he's been into drones for well over a decade, and the first drones that came out. Uh, long before they reached their popularity. So John's really pushing the wave. And I'd, and I'd like to leave you with another uh, important aspect of John's work. He's fully committed. Uh, he's the greatest of collaborators. He's passionate about his work, and you've seen that today. He's an excellent researcher. And he's also prepared to get, to get right in there, and uh, and he's not afraid, and he, he got, I mean he's he's sort of been referring to this this Highland cattle. He was gored. He was gored for goodness sakes in the pres in in the service of research. So he's fully committed. His work uh, speaks for itself. I've been honored to say a few supportive words to celebrate his work. I look forward to seeing what he'll he'll do next. Thank you, and congratulations, John. Congratulations. Thanks very much, Locke. So with that, I'll say thank you to Dr. Mark Petkow, who stepped in at the very last moment, <laughs> to Dr. Locke Fraser, who gave us a nice a summation and a, a really thoughtful um, reflection of his friend's work, and definitely to Dr. John Church, who gave us a, a really entertaining and informative lecture. And with that, we'll say congratulations one more time, and thanks again, John. Thank you.